Hallelujah. Glory to God. Lord, we give you praise and glory. Yes, this is day 23 of our 28 days in the word. How goes your fast? I do believe that you are enjoying the fast. Please make sure you are taking time to dwell in the word, taking time to pray, abstain from eating, abstain from social media as much as possible. Let's focus on God like we've been doing so far. It's immersion, submergence, overwhelming in the word, in prayer, and in a spirit of expectancy. Let's expect God to move, to speak, to direct, to impart, to change, to transform. Let there be metamorphosis. We believe for that in the mighty name of Jesus. So, yes, yesterday we had talked about chapter 22 in church, and we went through it at that point in time, towards the very end of that chapter. We find Paul... Um, being accused and being brought um, before um, before the captain of the host. And Paul had to say, I'm a freeborn. The captain had had to pay money to be a Roman. So Paul had a legal higher right than the Roman at that point in time. And so they had to lose his bands and also say that he should appear before the chief priest and the council so that was where we left paul yesterday please do go back and check the uh, message it's available on spreaker you'll be able to have the full cause of the message but i'll be going on to chapter 23 which is day three and paul earnestly beholding the council so paul had come to the point whereby he was now about to address them said men and brethren So, like I said, they always build a bridge. Always make sure that when you are about to make an argument that there is no sense of animosity, but rather you are presenting what is uh, common to both parties. So, he said, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Now, that's a heavy statement to make for someone who you are wondering, has he? But Paul, in his mind and truly had a good conscience before God because even when he was doing evil, he thought he was doing it for God. And when he found out the truth, he also went zealously after the truth to fulfill before God the things which God had spoken to him. Hallelujah. So it says, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. My prayer is that we'll be able at the very end of our lives to be able to boldly say we have lived before God in all conscience and before men as well. Meaning that we have followed the Holy Ghost, allowed him to lead us, allowed him to shape us, allowed him to bring about the beauty and the glory of God in us and through us to the world at large. So verse 2 says, And the high priest Ananias commanded them that they stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Now, Ananias is not the same Ananias and Sapphira. These are not Ananias. Remember, I said the Jewish people liked names the same way like in our culture. There are many James, there are many John, there are many Bartholobio, there are many Yinka, there are many Femi, there are many Ngozi, there are many Chinwendu, there are many of that. So that was what we also had here. So a certain high priest, the current high priest, was now called Ananias, made a statement that they should slap him. But according to the law, uh, which Paul understood, you can't just slap anybody without a definite reason unless you are from a superior position. And Paul did not recognize him because you see here, then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee. Because Paul had to answer because they slapped him. It was a heavy, hot slap. And he had to say, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For sitest thou to judge me after the law and commands someone else to smite me, contrary to the law. You know what the law is, but yet you stay there and you tell them to break the law in front of me. I mean, Pharisee, oh, don't forget. That was what Paul was saying. But at that point in time, if you notice, Paul lost his temper. He lost his cool. Please, as much as possible, Paul showed that he was purely human. 
but Paul was able to retrace his steps when opportunity was granted. You also be able to retrace your step and speak only words that suit, words that have grace salted in it. Your conversation should not be conversations of strife, of malice, of all kinds of things. Your conversation should be conversations that are comely, conversations that bring forth good tidings, conversations that are laced and salted with grace. That's what the scripture expects us to do. So you see in verse 4, when the opportunity came and they that stood by said, are you accusing or reviling the God's high priest? Because Paul wasn't aware when he realized that, oh, who he was attacking and accusing and really shouting at was the high priest. What did Paul do? Notice Paul didn't stay in his pride or in his anger. Paul was able to quickly switch and know I will not be put in a situation whereby my anger will make me sin against God. So look at what he did. Then said Paul, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest. And somebody's wondering, how does he know? Because the high priests were being changed during that season a lot. There were like four or five different high priests during the book of Acts. So, I wish not brethren, oh no, four, four, not five, four high priests. I wish not brethren that he was to the high priest, for it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. But underline this, that statement was by Paul. I need us to look at it very carefully. Paul was able to retrace his step and be able to operate with grace laced on his conversation. Paul was able to retrace his steps. Be able also to retrace your steps. But the second thing in that scripture, this particular verse, Acts chapter 23 verse 5, is that he said, It is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Or sometimes because of the pressures of Nigeria and the things going on, we are tempted to speak evil. And well, somebody will say it's facts now. We are not we are not lying. Yes, well, but it's still evil. We are tempted to speak evil of our leaders. We need to find creative ways of desisting from it. And even when we do find a way to escape from the trap that you are setting for yourself. Because we cannot speak evil of our leaders. We should not speak evil. You will see in later um epistles. Paul was still saying, instead of you speaking evil, pray for the uh, um, leaders. Pray that it may go well with you. So those are the things that we are commanded by the word of God to do, to pray for those who despitefully use us, especially when they are the leaders that should be serving, but rather are using us. You pray for those who despitefully use you. Mm -hmm. Verse 6, but when Paul perceived that the one part we are Sadducees, so we need to be perceptive. See, um, Bible says you should be gentle as doves, but as wise as serpents. So Paul here, well, and that's the word of Jesus. So it is Jesus, it's in red letter. See, Bible makes us know Paul was able to quickly sense that, oh, what can I use as a capitalizing point here? And Paul said, oh, he had seen that some were Sadducees and some were Pharisees. Remember, Paul was a Pharisee and knew what they believed. And remember, he also had an idea about the Sadducees. The Pharisees were the ones that had a strict um, adhering to the laws of Moses and taught from that angle. Sadducees felt that some of the things Moses said were not completely complete, but they would still teach Moses, but not with strong emphasis. So here, Paul looked, he saw, he just cried to the council, Men and brethren, I'm a Pharisee. So Paul began to give his CV. I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Not just that I stumbled on it, it's in our lineage. We are Pharisees in our family. I'm a family, Pharisee, a son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I'm called in question. And that the Pharisees believe, that there is hope, in the resurrection of the dead. The Pharisees believe it because it's part of the things that Moses had spoken about and King David had said, so they believe it. So Paul looked, if I bring this, the two of them will fight. I can just say, because we, we don't agree, let's agree to disagree. But that's not the outcome of the situation. Verse 7, And when he had so said, 
there arose a dissension that's a disagreement a um um a fight in a debate between the pharisees and the sadducees and the multitude was divided so there were a lot of pharisees and a lot of sadducees and the multitudes were divided for the sadducees say that there is no resurrection so they didn't believe in resurrection neither is there any angel so they didn't believe in any angelic visitations at all in what moses wrote they did not believe and they did not believe that there was anything called spirits everything ends here so the sadducees were a bit less strict and could do things um revel um do parties and do all those things and feel that nothing nothing spoiled Mm -hmm. But the Pharisees confess all these things, that there is a resurrection, meaning that there is a judgment after everything, that there is um, a spirit and there, is all, there are angels. So they believe that. And there arose a great cry. So everybody started shouting, debating, arguing. And the scribes that were of the Pharisees, part, arose and strove, saying, Ah, uh-uh, ah, we find no evil in this man. But these were the people that were ready to accuse him, that wanted to kill him. Now they were saying, we find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel had spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Now I want to bring you back to a statement made by Gamaliel that when he said that, ah, uh, brethren, please let us look at this thing. If we disturb the apostle Peter and John, (laughs) if it is God that spoke, we are fighting God. But if it's not, they will come to naught. So it was a Pharisee that could think that way. A Sadducee did not think that way. Now he says, verse 10, And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the uh, castle. Rem- uh, underline by force. You know why? Because these people had grabbed Paul, were pulling him. No, he's okay. No, he's not. No, he's okay. And they were pulling and could have torn him in pieces if they had their way. So they came in and the people, the Sadducee and Pharisee, were too angry to even uh, recognize that there were soldiers in their midst. So the soldiers had to use force to grab Paul from their hands. Remember, it will still come back to hunt them. Let's go on. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, so now that the next night, the Lord appeared to Paul and said, be of good cheer. If you have the red letter Bible, you will see that it is in red, which means Jesus, the Lord, appeared to him. He said, be of good cheer. You know, that's what you will expect. Ah, Jesus coming and I'm in prison. He's telling me, be of good cheer. Okay. Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, you know, you are, you are about to hear them, you have 10 cities, or you are blessed, and you no, know, what Jesus said was, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Mm. You know, Paul had been the one saying, I don't mind even to go to Rome, I don't mind even to go to Rome. Now Jesus was saying, ah, you have done well, you have done well, my son, to have defended me in Jerusalem. Thou shalt go to Rome as well. You see, um, in this junction, let me just quickly put this. The reward of work is more work. Mm-hmm. And the reward of fantastic work is more fantastic projects to do. So here, Paul had done a fantastic job of defending the gospel. And now, Jesus gave him a fantastic project. Get this message to Rome. Only you can enter Rome and declare so paul was given an assignment remember paul is not feeling adverse about the situation because even jesus had said i will show you things that thou must suffer for my name so paul was prepared that was his template of entrance into the gospel he was ready verse 12 says and when it was day certain of the jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse saying uh, curse or oaths or they swore an oath saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Mm. Oh my goodness. So for these people gathered and said, see, it will not be well for us if um, if Paul is not dead. We will not eat, we will not drink. If we eat or drink, it will not be well with us. That's something close to what they had said. 
So they provoked curses on themselves until they had killed Paul before they would be free from the curses. Mm -hmm. Verse 13. And there were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. So it was a conspiracy they had gathered together to discuss Paul's matter. And I looked the best ways. Let us take this oath. We need to kill him. Now you will notice some things that will happen because of this. Verse 14. And they, are ca and they came to the chief priest. So it wasn't chief priest that sent them the message. Just like a Paul would say, please come and give me letters to go to Damascus. These people were zealous also. And elders. And said, we have bound ourselves under a great cause on the line. They didn't say a small cause. They said it will not be well with them, their self, their children. Something of that nature. So it was a great cause that they bound themselves by. Now, I need to quickly say this. Never, never promise what you are not too sure you can keep. In fact, don't make an oath. Just simply fulfill what is in your heart to do. Making an oath and saying, ah, I will do this, I will do this. And you don't do it. The Bible says it is to your oath. It's against you. So don't make an oath. These guys made an oath that they could not keep. You will find out now. So they said, we will not eat. Um, that." Just send for Paul, you know, uh, send for him. So they said, as he's coming, uh, that you just want to ask on, uh, on those matters more perfectly. That let me understand what you are saying, Paul. Teach us what you are saying so that we can understand. That was the ploy. But in the plan, as Paul is being sent to come to them, they would kill him on the way. So there was no problem for the um captain and was there any problem from them because they were not they did not get to the destination and he left the um residence so that was what they had planned and when paul's sister so sometimes i need to uh, i need to say this to you that um you need to be able to be the kind of person that people will be willing to stand for you you see paul's sister's son that means his nephew overheard all that they were saying and he went on to paul remember they had said anybody can come to paul this young guy went on to paul this young guy went on to paul and in this in it he was able to tell paul what was going on but i also want to say this please because we may lose sight of this you see there was the young guy who went to paul but there is a spirit in you that can tell you things to come. Don't wait for the young guys to come only. Pray that the Lord will speak to you and give you direction, will tell you things to come. Because that's what the Holy Spirit is meant to do. In fact, let's do it together. Let's pray right now. Just declare, Heavenly Father, pray with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending the Holy Ghost to help me. One of the ministries of the Holy Ghost is to show me things to come. I ask you, Holy Spirit, show me things to come. Guide my steps. Help me to see what I should see, to hear what I should hear, and to conceive and to know what I should know. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So here we see in verse 17, Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he had a certain thing to tell him. So Paul didn't tell the centurion because Paul was not aware who was in the pay of the Sanhedrin, the pay of the council in Jerusalem. So he didn't know. So that's why he just told him uh, there's something that he wants to tell the um, chief captain. So the man, that's the centurion, and please note what centurion means. A man or a soldier that is in charge of a hundred soldiers. So the centurion um, took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul, the prisoner, called me unto him and prayed me, and, which is more or less begged me to bring this young man unto thee who had something to say unto thee. Verse 19, then the chief captain took him by the hand and went to the side to talk with him privately. What is it that thou hast to tell me? Now, this um, 
this chief captain you will notice by his body posture by his body language was um a, a nice man one then two he was a man that most likely had moral a moral compass two then three he respected paul so you will notice he took the boy took the lad he knew that it must have been a sensitive matter that paul wanted to discuss and took him away where they could talk in confidence and when the boy told him what they had planned to do that's in verse 20 that they were to bring paul to the council and it would look like they wanted to ask about what Paul was saying better, but they were planning to kill him. And there were 40 men who had taken an oath. Now I need to now explain what that oath also meant. In the battle schemes in the, um, in the old times, people will take oaths or stand in positions whereby until death, until death. So um, in the early crusades, you will find that even when the knights will want to fight with a small band of, um, uh, okay, their names are Muslim. They would find that the Muslims will take a note, then they will tie their feet together, tie their knees to the, um, the um, leg to the body of their thigh, tie it and stay in one position to fight, which meant I am not moving from here. Is either you kill me or I kill you. And many a times that posture would either upturn the battle or it will be that it's to their ruin. So these guys had already prepared themselves and said, we are ready to die. So that was what was very crucial. If they had said it's just in passing, it would have, no, they had cursed themselves. So they knew they did not want to die. That's one. They didn't want all those bad omens that they had spoken to come to pass. Then on top of that, they cannot eat or drink. So there's serious motivation that Paul must die. Because ah, if it is hunger, it is two days, it's three days, ah, I will kill this man to be able to eat. Drink, they are not drinking. So there was already aggravation. So they knew such people are dangerous. Now, um, verse 22. So the captain then let the young man depart, but told him clearly, don't tell anyone what you have told me, lest the um, information comes out and they are able to retaliate. So verse 23. And he called unto him two centurions. Now you will see why the centurion was important. Two centurions. Now those two centurions means that they have 200 people under their care. Each, uh, each one has a hundred. Now saying, make ready 200 soldiers, meaning 100, to go to Caesarea. And horsemen, three scores. Horsemen, three scores means, uh, three scores and ten means 70. So 70 horsemen will be there, and the spearmen 200 at the third hour of the night, meaning they needed a major army to just guard one man, Paul. Why would they bring such? Why wasn't that you said, okay, just take 15 of the best soldiers that we have and take Paul? They knew that some people had sworn. Some people had said they would not eat or drink. And they had not drank for some days. They had not eaten. These guys were vicious. These guys would go to any length. So he needed to make enough preparation. So 200 soldiers. Within them were sword, um, spearmen. And within them also horsemen. So some that were on the horses had spear. And they were on top. And the others had their spear in hand as well. So we had 70 horses that are guarding Paul apart from Paul's own beast that will carry him. Then they also had at least 130 soldiers walking around about Paul to protect him from any harm. I just saw this. When I described that picture, did you see Paul in the center? Because you need to be able to imagine that Paul is in the center of what I described. 130 soldiers who are facing all angles, 130, protecting one man. And then you have 70 on horseback amongst them, meaning they have advantage to see higher around them to protect one man. Sama, 
That is a human being providing protection for someone that he feels he respects or he feels he is, is in his care. How much more our Heavenly Father God who loves us, who we are the apple of his eye, who will never leave us nor forsake us. How much more the arsenal of angels and weapons of warfare round about you to protect you in all your ways, lest you dash a foot against a stone. How much more the level of protection that is available to you as a person that you are hid in the secret place of the Most High under the shadow of the Almighty uh, that you will see of the Lord is your refuge, your fortress, your God in whom you trust. A thousand may fall by thy side, ten thousand by thy right hand, but no evil shall befall thee. Notice Paul in the center, you in the center. Remember also that if you are in the center, the, it just simply makes us understand that we are hid in Christ as Christ is hid in God. That's the kind of mindset you should have. If Paul was protected by a human being who felt i need to protect how much more the god of the universe protecting you have confidence hallelujah and provide them beasts that they may set paul on meaning that it was more than uh, one but either which way when they wrote beast there it meant a four-legged animal so it could have been a camel it could have been um um whatever is it was a, an animal that paul will ride on and it was to be taken to felix the governor who was not where they were felix was in caesarea while paul uh, at that point in time before setting off was in jerusalem now verse 25 and he wrote a letter after this manner so he now wrote his name claudius lysias unto the most excellent governor felix sendeth greeting notice that when you are trying to approach or appeal to people you should be able to speak words of grace words of honor so he started off with words of honor to the man to tell him ah ah sir you are the most excellent so when you also are trying to do some business with um people in uh, alausa especially people that uh, you call them you have to call them honorable Honorable Femi, Honorable Benga, Honorable this. Because at that point in time, they are honorable. Or well, we expect them to be honorable. And so we give them that honor. Okay, so go on. Verse 27. This man was taken of the Jews. So he's telling him why he's sending. And should have been killed of them. Then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. Notice the presentation he gave there. He didn't tell him about what was the problem. He didn't say, he just said, so, because he needed to write something on why he's sending the person. We'll find out in later chapters why he did something like this and why it's important to do that. So he said, uh, um, I, when I understood he was a Roman, I had to deliver him because we, uh, we will not allow Jews to kill a Roman. Mm. So, Verse 28, and when I would have known the cause, what was the reason whereof they accused him, I brought him forth into their council. So I brought him there, whom I perceive, and there is a reason for the Romans, they will never allow for you to kill or to imprison anyone that has not been tried. And the both parties that have the, um, the argument will have to be on ground. So that's why I took Paul to the council and brought, or brought the council and Paul into the same place. Verse 29, whom I perceive to be accused of questions about their law, but have nothing laid to his charge, worthy of death or of bonds. This will just had made me to put him in bonds, uh, but there is nothing. They, we shouldn't kill him. And they, what they wanted to kill him for is not um, legal. And the bonds that they are trying to get us to do is not legal as well. So he said that. And when it was told me how the Jews laid wait for the man, I sent straight away to D and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before you what they had against him. Farewell. So here was Lysias, uh, Lysias being able to um, relieve himself of the responsibility of Paul and send him to a higher authority. Mm -mm 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 -mm. 
sometimes when there is a dispute or sometimes when there is something that you know you are not capable of hand, handling, send it to the people that are ahead of you so that they can sort it out. You don't need to crack your brain or get into trouble trying to deal with it. Send it above. Make sure you are not getting yourself into things that will put you in, also in trouble. We have hierarchy in the office, hierarchy in church, hierarchy in the home. Don't let it be that you are taking laws into your hands. Simply send to the next level of authority for them to deal with the issue. And that's what Lysias had done. He had sent it to the governor. It's now the governor's problem because he has relieved himself of the responsibility of Paul by doing what he did. Verse 31, Then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. So they brought him to Antipatris, a city situated between Joppa and Caesarea in a very fertile region, not far from the coast, rebuilt by Herod the Great and named Antipatris in honor of his father, the Antipater. Okay, so just for your knowledge. On the morrow, they left the horsemen to go with him, meaning after having done a day, you know, they went in um, 9 p.m., the time when it came to morning and they were on the road, they knew that, okay, now Paul is in a place whereby they can't go and attack. This is between Joppa and Caesarea. And we're going to Caesarea. Joppa, no, no right-thinking person will go into a Roman colony that you are a Jew and go and kill there. You kill a Roman. While you are in, um, in Jerusalem, it's still, yes, it's a Roman colony, but you have a right to do some things. But outside there, so when they had done that, they sent back the 130 soldiers that were accompanying the had spears. And it was just the 70 um, horsemen with spears that was now with um, Paul. Verse 33, who when they came to Caesarea and delivered the epistle to the governor, presented Paul also before him. Now, you remember that in Caesarea Philippi also, you have Philip and all those ones, but he doesn't, the governor was the one that he was handed over to, and the senator could not come in to start getting into the matters. And moreover, he had been sent to a Roman and not to the Jewish. Okay, so just to clear things. So, um, at that point in time, who, when they came to Caesarea, delivered the epistle and presented Paul unto them. Verse 34, and when the governor had read the letter, he asked of what province he was, and when he understood that he was of Cilicia. You know why? Because a Roman will not start getting or meddling in matters that they, it does not concern them. Any tradition, but if you are a Roman, yeah, I can hear this case. So he asked, and Paul said, I'm a Cilicia. Oh, I will hear thee, said he when thine accusers are also come. Notice he didn't hear Paul's side because the Romans believe both parties need to be on ground before a matter is heard. Mm -mm 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 -mm. That means you shouldn't hear one side of a story and assume that is all. You should hear both sides of the story before you make a verdict. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So when the accusers come, I will hear and then we will make a judgment. And he commanded him to be kept in the Herod's judgment hall. So Paul was kept in the Herod's judgment hall because he had now been sent to um, Caesarea to meet with Festus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, hallelujah, we have looked at this thing and we have realized that here is Paul who could easily just have um, said, um, this thing I've been saying so far, don't mind me, I was just joking. Please, let's us go. Let's drop this matter and uh, in fact, I'm willing to renounce everything. No, Paul was willing to die for the sake of the gospel if need be. Paul was determined enough that I will do what is required. Now, in all of that does not mean that Paul uh, was, was the one doing it. In fact, it was the Holy Ghost in Paul that was showing us a pattern of what to do, of how to be, of what to receive. Receiving that earnestness to serve God as we should. Receiving that ability and capacity and grace from God to live our lives in such a manner that you can say, I, I, I have good conscience before God 
and men. So we saw some of these things as we progress in the next chapter. We will find out why some things were done and we'll be able to move ahead. But the prayer I prayed for you is that God will give you ears that are here. Oh, well, that's, I said this in another um, way, but let me say this one. God will give you ears that are here, eyes that see, and a mouth that speaks the right things. Hallelujah. And receives the right things from God. Ears that hear the voice of God, eyes that see the ways of God, and a heart that receives the revelations of God. That's my prayer for you today in Jesus' name. God bless you. You have an amazing time. See you tomorrow by God's grace where we go into chapter 24 and we do this consistently. God bless you. Bye-bye.